you are speaking to us and that you do live and want to see us come closer to you every day of our lives because you are our Heavenly Father and you want to have a relationship with us. And we pray that you bless Aidan and you bless us because we want to be your people who want to live in fellowship with you and one another. May your name be glorified. Amen. Uh, greetings, everyone. Okay, so tonight I uh, want us to uh, address the question, what is our calling? But actually the, the question I really want to probe is, do we want this calling? By calling I mean generally the uh, calling that's shared among ourselves as the body of Christ, our prophetic calling to reach the nations for their transformation through uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then to consider, are we ready for this calling? Now I know that we're all familiar with the Great Commission. As far as I, I can tell, generally speaking, uh, Christians within the uh, Evangelical, the Protestant, the Pentecostal wing of Christianity, uh, they've generally come to full applying uh, the Great Commission that Jesus gave to his disciples to our own context uh, as the basis for our collective calling. And we know how to talk about uh, this in sort of platitudes, you know, that the gospel is for everyone, the gospel is for all kinds of people, the gospel is for all nations. We know the passages of Paul about there being one body in Christ, Jew and Gentile, uh, or neither um, uh, Greek uh, uh, nor barbarian, but all are one in Christ. But I guess the question that we always need to ask ourselves is, are we deep down uh, resistant to this calling? Does something hold us back? And um, you think about our context where we are here, we're in the Balkans, and as people say, there's a reason they call this part of the world the Balkans. It's a divided area among ethnic and racial and religious lines. So my focus tonight will be on the book of Jonah. There's two reasons for that. It's fresh in my mind. Our fender and I helped uh, facilitate a conference uh, in Karani recently. So I might as well work with what's fresh in my mind. And also because um, I really think it's pertinent to uh, the question that I'm probing. But how is the Old Testament prophet related to our calling? And what's his relevance? Well, he uh, was called to be a prophet to a people that he wasn't desirous to serve to. Now, looking at Jonah, Jonah is an unusual book among the collection of the prophets, whether the, the major prophets or the minor prophets. Uh, the first thing that stands out with the book of Jonah is it's, it's mostly narrative compared to the other prophetic books, which have lots of sermons, lots of instructions, uh, poetic speeches, denunciations, direct speech coming from God that he's meant to impart on to the, uh, the people. But also, Jonah has a unique calling in the Old Testament context. He's called to speak to a pagan city. And that's very unusual. Now, it's not unusual to see in the prophets uh, prophecies about other nations, but generally speaking, the true recipients are Israel, but in this context, they were the direct. They were meant to be the direct recipients of his ministry, and because uh, God sent him to uh, preach a message of repentance, or else. And the other thing that stands out about this book is the way that people respond. That they they repent. And that you don't really see this as a pattern in Israel's history, not, not in the same way. Um, uh, actually, the one who's more rebellious is, is, is Jonah himself, and he's contrasted with the pagans throughout, uh, the, 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 the seafarers and the, the inhabitants of the sea. Um, but yeah, their, their response stands out, and uh, it's unusual because, like for instance, Ezekiel uh, was told, "You're going to speak to my people, and they're not going to listen to you." But uh, yeah, Jonah's audience—they listened. But let's just focus on 
his call to ministry. So he receives a call from God, and uh, all it says is, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, to go to Nineveh. We don't have any other background information about him. All we know is the son of Amittai, which means that it seems like he's also mentioned in 2 Kings, uh, chapter, 7, uh, chapter 14. So he was a contemporary of Amos. And that's all we know about him. And it just, just jumps into the story. Go to Nineveh. And uh, Nineveh was a pagan city of the uh, empire of Assyria. And we're going to think more about who Assyria was uh, as it relates to uh, the relevance of our, our message. But what does Jonah do? What is Jonah, how does Jonah respond to God? He, well, he doesn't respond. He's silent. And then he just flees. And you, you could imagine if we were like flies on a wall and we were witnesses to this. And we'd be all looking around thinking, can he do that? Can he just flee? <laughs> Apparently he thinks he can do that. Um, and the thing about Jonah is, the other thing about Jonah, the, the book of Jonah, is that it jumps straight into the story. It doesn't muck around with details. But it kind of does muck around with details describing the lengths at which he went to get away from God. It reminds me of something like from Looney Tunes or something when I was growing up as a boy where one of the characters wants to run away from his nemesis so he puts him in a parcel, he, he, he bobs the, uh, the door with planks, gets on uh, uh, trains and planes and gets away and then he sort of sighs a breath of relief, turns around and there's his nemesis. <laughs> And it's not so embellished in the biblical account, but he, 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 he um, you know, it's, it's, he goes down, he gets his call somewhere in Canaan. He was meant to go uh, to um, Assyria, which, uh, to Nineveh, which is in the northeast. He goes southeast to uh, the seafaring city of Joppa, with a view toward, and he pays the fare to the person with a view toward catching a, uh, a ship all the way to Tarshish, which probably represents far, far west, or maybe even far, far east, but not in the direction he was meant to go. But we all know that you can't unrun God. Outrun God. And God catches up with Jonah. He exhibited his power, firstly, by what? The storm. So then the Lord sent a great wind upon the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So there's, there's so much irony going on in this story. And um, God is using the storm to uh, send a message. And uh, Jonah's sleeping... The, uh, the seafarers are working the hardest to deal with the situation. And even God is even using random chants to highlight uh, his own folly. By, when, the, the, when they cast lots to find out who's responsible, it lands on Jonah, and then they're interrogating him to find out who he is, and then he's saying, well, I worship the God of earth and the sea. So God is catching up with him. And that's not all. By the time he's thrown into the water, God prepares the sea creature to swallow him up. And that's the consequences of his rebellion catching up with him. But the sea creature is so full of... Uh, uh, it's very symbolic and full of meaning. And it's, it, it represents the turning point in his life. It was a life to death to death to life experience all over again. It was his journey to the watery underworld. He like in in, in so chapter two is his his uh, prayer of thanksgiving, and he likens his experience to uh, being in the depths of Sheol. It's similar to the thanksgiving psalm that you see in Psalm one hundred sixteen. So, and you think here, Jonah understands better than to be re 
rebelling against God. He speaks about the folly of those who turn to idols. So Jonah has this transformative experience like nothing we could imagine. And in fact, Jesus um, likens himself to Jonah with, his, with the experience that he was going to undertake for death and resurrection. So what more could God do? So he gets this transformative experience and he gets another chance and, he's, and we know he's spit out onto dry land. So we're back on dry land. And so here we are. Okay, let's start this calling all over again. And uh, what stands out at the, ver at the beginning of chapter 3 is the, the comparison and the contrast at the beginning of the book. So then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave, give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed for, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. And that's verses 1 to 5 from chapter 3. And there's more details given in that account which even includes the king proclaiming uh, a, fa uh, a fast and, and repentance. And so, this is a very sincere gesture of repentance from the people. But the contrast for Jonah is plain. He does as he's told. And you can tell by the descriptions of, of how Jonah went about it that he wasn't taking any shortcuts. He, he journeyed a, a day's journey through, through um, the, uh, the city, preaching. Um, and he was a well-received preacher. They, uh, they liked his sermon. I don't know if you guys are enjoying this at the moment, but they enjoyed his sermon. <laughs> and as a result, they were blessed. And so here we think, well, okay, we have a happy ending. We can end the story. Apparently not. Apparently not. Jonah has a complaint. He sits outside the city, he starts uh, sulking, as, as we do when we feel hard done by. And he just sits there, hoping to see that they will be destroyed. And Jonah complains. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That, that's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, It is right, is it right for you to be angry? And that's at the beginning of chapter 4. So, isn't God's mercy a good thing? I mean, for you and I, wouldn't we say it's a good thing? Of course it is, but you know, sometimes we don't see eye to eye with God. Sometimes we feel we have a better sense of justice than He has. And okay, so looking more at who were the Assyrians? Who were these people that He was called to preach to? Well, yeah, the Ninevites were part of the Assyrian kingdom. And this is part of the reason, well, this is the reason for his refusal to uh, fulfill his calling. The Assyrians, they were renowned for cruelty. They were a cruel people. Uh, they had some unimaginable uh, methods of uh, uh, capital punishment. Uh, as they were a growing empire at this time, they weren't as big as they'd become, but as they conquered more and more, that what they would used to do is they used to scatter the, the bones of uh, the dead on the on the, the road so that you know that you so that you would know the Assyrians have been here and the Assyrians are coming to a city near you. It was a fear tactic. And uh, these are the guys would have, that would eventually conquer the northern tribes of Israel. Um, the, the ones that Jonah had also uh, uh, preached to himself. 
um, like I like to say, he was a contemporary of Amos, and he Jonah actually prophesied the blessing of Jeremiah, Jeroboam II, even though Jeroboam II wasn't a good king. Um, God blessed uh, that period of Israel, uh, Israel's history, but they were it was they were in a state of rebellion to God as well. So. His own people didn't deserve mercy either. And I, I, I'm wondering, does Jonah realise this? And what about Jonah's transformative experience? Was it now all in vain? The death to life experience? Well, maybe we'll hold that for for now. But clearly... As Christians, when we get saved, we do have we do have further baggage, don't we? And in our Balkan context, in this area of the world of divided territories among ethnicities and religious identities and other identities, and not just that, but a, a history of conflict right through history up until recent history, oppression, we have hurts. We have pain, we have resentment, all that equals baggage. And um, even though Assyria wasn't the mighty power that conquered Israel yet, maybe, maybe Jonah had some inkling that these, these were the guys that were going to eventually conquer us. Maybe that was part of his reason for not wanting to send the, the message of mercy to them. In any case, if we have baggage, doesn't this become a barrier to us fulfilling our calling to bring the, uh, the gospel to the nations? Prejudices uh, will hamper us from reaching out to those we lack affection for or lack concern for. Now the call to reach the nations then is harder than we first realise. So it's easy to say, yes, the gospel's for, for everyone, but when we think about the implications of that, it's harder than we realise. And you see this kind of tension play out early on in, in the history of Christianity. You see it in, in the Gospels with the Samaritans, the Samaritans and the, the, the Jews, and you see it in, and with the, the Gentile and the Jew in the Book of Acts. Hence, the reason Paul had to explain about the theological reality of the, the body of Christ being neither Jew nor Gentile, um, all under one headship of Christ. The reason he had to do that was because it was in a context of tension from the very beginning. So again, it's, it's easy to sound pious, it's easy to say the right platitudes. And actually, I don't actually want to sound like I'm virtue signaling like some sort of politician can easily do. You know, suggesting that... Um, and nor am I making suggestions about what our political views about various stuff should be, whether it's on immigration or whatever. And of course, justice is a complex subject. Hurts are real and they matter, they matter to us, and I'm sure they matter to God. And what I don't want to do is pretend that these issues are not there. Now, various groups, yeah, they have various cultural differences among each other. They have different social, economic uh, contexts, which come with various problems, which become burdensome to other people. So what I'm suggesting is not that we pretend these things aren't there, but we ask ourselves, how do we navigate through these complexities? In love, in wisdom. Because if we're not willing to do that, then we're going to be hampered from uh, preaching the gospel. Now, I, I, what I want to say, though, is with the example of the Ninevites responding the way they did, that's obviously not the norm. Uh, the, the way they responded was, one, they responded quickly, and they responded genuinely. And I think in our own ministry context, that's not what we usually experience. So I think, I think in a way we can sort of harbour the kind of feelings of resentment and 
journey had because of that. Because we can feel like these people were too hard. These people were too godless. These people make life too difficult for me. And I, I think if we have a, a guideline in place that Jesus would say, people are responsible for their own response to him. We're not responsible for what God does in other people and we're not responsible to how they respond to God. What we are responsible to is that we tell people, we tell people the gospel. And we see Jesus actually compare those who didn't respond to his teaching to those, um, like so, so some of the godless villagers that he visited who refused to come to him and he cited the Ninevites as well. They repented when I came. And he, he gave his disciples this, um, what he said to his disciples was, you know, if they're not willing to listen, just shake the dust off, off your feet and let that be a testimony. So I think we can take confidence that um, we can bring the gospel to people. We don't need to worry about whether or not they will respond, but they do need to hear. And we need to be confident that ultimately people will respond to the gospel, even if it takes time. Would we ever respond like Jonah, not being happy that people turn to God? Would there ever be a time we feel like that? I mean, possibly if we've been hurt by someone? Maybe. It's worth asking. But in view of all these things that might hamper us from bringing the gospel to people, what should form the basis to speak into these concerns? And this is really uh, getting to my conclusion. So for all the complexity that we have, that some people are hard to reach, that we have hurts, that we have baggage, what should be our guiding, um, what, what should be guiding us? And really it comes back to the heart of God. And the heart of God is seen uh, at the end of the book of Jonah. So there's an ongoing argument between Jonah and God. Jonah is bitter, he's envious, he feels hard done by, the Ninevites are destroyed, he's out, in, he's out in, under the sun, under the scorching sun, his head is burning. For a while he had the nice plant that grew above, but we all know what a pesky little insect can do overnight. And that didn't last long for him. So he feels even more justified to feel like a victim and to feel like he knows better than God's sense of justice. But God has the final word. His words are the last recorded words in the book of Jonah. And this is where we get to the heart of God. So Jonah protests to God and Again, when, when, we're, when we're angry, we often speak and act irrationally that contradicts even our core values. But God asks him a question, and this is, this is how God deals with his beloved children. Instead of lording it over us, instead of playing a guilt trip, he asks us questions. So he says, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he says, yes. Of course it is. And I'm so angry I wish I were dead. So again, I think he's I think he's probably allowing the circumstances to get the better of him. And here we hear the very heart of God that underpins his mercy, verses 10 to 11. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about the plant, though you didn't make it grow or, or attend to it. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. So what God is doing is he's framing, before he gets into, into saying what he's about to say to Jonah, he's putting things into perspective for Jonah. And then he continues. And should not I have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So God cares about a large number of people in the city of Nineveh. People who are lost. 
And on account of the deception of sin, they don't know any better. They neither know their right hand from their left. Now, he even includes the animals on the list of those he cares about. So God loves his creation, especially that which is endowed with life. But of course, his pe the people, the image bearers of him are the ones that were emphasised. So he cares about the crowd and he cares about the individuals. Especially since they, they lack God's law, his Torah, which is the guiding word that he gave to Israel. So in this way, they don't know their, their right hand from the left. And this is probably how the Ninevites contrast with Israel, actually, because the Israelites, they should have known better when they were turning their backs on God. And yet God didn't want to leave these people to their own destruction at this time. Why on this occasion? I don't know, but it, it, maybe it speaks to the New Testament context that we're in where the Gospel is for all nations. And so yeah, this, this passage is really remarkable in that it's, it's found in the Old Testament and he's speaking about a, a pagan city that were not a part of the promises at this time. But if God says, I want to be merciful to these people, then who are we to say that he can't be? And in our own context, we're not likely to begrudge people God's mercy, but deep down we do. I think that's probably a more realistic uh, application that we, we do have hurts. We do have bitterness. And it does affect our sincerity and willingness and resolve to bring the, the, the gospel to all people. Now, now, one level this book kind of feels a bit incomplete and unresolved because you're left wondering, well, does Jonah end up changing his mind? Or does he just say, holding this opinion? And we're going to agree to disagree, God. I'm not sure, but I think it's fitting that God has the final word in this book, expressing his heart. And maybe, maybe it speaks to the Christian life. We are reborn, but our mortal nature remains. And because our mortal nature remains, our memories will remain. And so there's baggage that we have, that we hold. But what is true? Well, in, in our New Testament context, we know that the Gospel is for everyone. We know that that God isn't willing that any should perish. And I think this should be our, our guiding principle. And in our Balkan context where everyone hates each other, <laughs> can I say it that way? <laughs> God loves the people we don't get along well with. He gets along with He gets along with me. So if he can get along with me, he can get along with other people. Um, so I think our, our hearts should align with God. And is anyone too hard for God? And maybe, maybe again, maybe in our ministry context, whether it's serving the Albanians or other uh, people groups, it can feel like that. But again, just going back to Jesus' instructions, you know? If you're not responsible to how they respond, but just make sure that they hear the message. And if you're faithful, you will see fruit in time. Or maybe you won't, but maybe. But there, there will be fruit. Because God has promised that his gospel will bear fruit. But just, just we must always keep in mind that resentment will choke us and will prevent us from fulfilling our calling. And, and you wouldn't want to, and, and because of resentment, you wouldn't want it to, um, you wouldn't want to lose an unexpected uh, opportunity either. 
you know, maybe, maybe, maybe in your ministry context, you feel like giving up in, in your particular area, and maybe it is the time to give up and, and do something else. But don't hold that grudge so that it affects your, um, so that you would lose an unexpected opportunity for someone else. Um, and that would be tragic. But yeah, I think we can take a lot of confidence out of this story, a lot of insight, and uh, it's it, and a lot of encouragement that and that God is in the business of mercy, and uh, He's in the business of being um, patient with us as well. Amen. Amen.